Hello everyone and welcome to the Anvils of Connor YouTube channel. In today's video I wanted to take a closer look at my tools of the trade so to speak and break down their individual uses and at what part of the converting process I would use any specific tool. I'm going to break this video down into three very easy to follow segments. Uh, first of which being the preparation of the individual components ready for the conversion. The second section will be posing and then the third section will be sculpting. Now to accompany these videos I will of course add tutorials at a later date but I just wanted to give you guys a rundown on what I consider absolute essentials if you are to partake in any converting for your tabletop hobby, hobby to make individual characters and, uh, and make your army a little bit more unique. So you've managed to get your mitts on that brand new box set or the individual components that you'd need to make that rad conversion you've been looking for to add some, some uniqueness to your army for some time. In this portion of the video I wanted to have a quick breakdown of the individual tools that I would implore each and every one of you to get hold of so you can make your life a lot easier in the preparation process. Working from left to right then, we have a couple of pairs of, of clippers here, you can see. So I've got a, a very high quality, rather expensive pair of Tamiya clippers here at the top, which are excellent for precision cutting off sprues uh, and very, very good for softer materials like resin and plastic. And I have a pair of maybe old, I think, Games Workshop clippers here. They're not quite so fine at the top there. They're not excellent at taking things off sprues, they are very, very good for cutting things like copper and uh, paper clips, like brass paper clips down the line. You do not want to damage these. Okay, these are for soft materials only. Um, so you wanted to have a beta pair, and then, well, <laughs> that actually makes sense uh, with the Greek alphabet as well, and an alpha pair, let's say. Okay, so two pairs of clippers there, um, just to ensure that you can get the you get your money's worth basically from the expensive pair there. With thicker mold gates, things like um, resin gates rather from Forge World products. It's very important to have um, a really good hobby saw. Okay, These are by the company Ravel. Um, I ended up buying a second one because I believe I'd lost the first but ended up turning up um, <laughs> in the deepest depths of my of my conversion, conversion kit. Um, but uh, I've got a couple of blades here. I've got a very fine blade here which is great for working with infantry models, cutting off parts of arms, cutting through the mid-sections. In fact, this is the, the style of saw that I use to do my true scaling process. And then you've got the, the thicker blade here, which is fantastic for much larger kits. Um, things like basing, I will use this more often, um, with more often, because it's, you know, some of the large resin components that you get with character bases from Forge World uh, need a little bit more uh, oomph to get, them, to get them going. To the right of that, you'll see a Swan Morton um, scalpel with a 10A scalpel blade and then there's also a 9 scalpel blade there as well. So these are very very useful for removing mold lines, removing excess uh, material after I've done gap filling on tanks, things along those lines and rest assured I will be following these videos up uh, with, with practical tutorials if you will. Um, so hold fire on that for now. Uh, to the right of these I've got some basic files. Now I'm not overly keen on using files, I'll generally opt to use a scalpel blade instead where I can. It's just a little bit more precise, well much more precise in my opinion, provided you use a fresh scalpel blade. Uh, it's an awful lot more precise for removing things like mold lines and I think there is a, a massive risk of overdoing it with, with hand files uh, where you can potentially remove detail and, and remove large chunks of the resin or plastic on a model. Generally, I will reserve the use of files for things like metal where possible. Um, and there are some other applications as well. Again, things like basing, uh, but generally I'll, I'll use those fairly infrequently. Uh, at the bottom there, you can see some very fine grit sandpaper. This is 320, okay, very, very fine indeed. There are some instances in which I'll use these. Um, I actually have found that using them during the painting process to remove some um, sort of decals once they've been varnished uh, that can be very handy indeed. Um, but as I said earlier, I'll, I'll probably make a separate tutorial video on that at some other time. Now to the right of those, you can see these chisels here, okay? Now these, uh, I will give links for all of these tools as well um, underneath in the description. But these are very, very good tools indeed 
for removing any surface detail, um, maybe filigree, something along those lines, and things like Adeptus Titanicus models, where you want to remove maybe the Imperial Aquila, if you're doing a, a Traitor Legio, for example, um, or simply for, for cutting out a small slot. So um, a good recent application I had for this was ensuring that the where the magazine would clip into a bolter, for example, I scored some lines with a 10A, the tip of a 10A, and then was able to very, very gently chisel out any excess material in resin from that bolter, so it looked realistic. I didn't have to paint a, a black rectangle or anything along those lines. Uh, it worked very, very nicely indeed. Now, with all of these tools, pretty much, you are going to produce a little bit of um, detritus and dust, things along those lines. So just to ensure that your components are nice and clean as you move forwards, I would urge you to get like a little makeup brush like this one here, um, so you can you can clean them up as you go. And that will also come in handy in some of the later stages as well. So you've beautifully prepared those individual components ready to start making these models. In this second section, I'm just gonna be covering the materials that I find absolutely invaluable in ensuring that I'm able to pose my models correctly, first and foremost, um, the ones that give me the biggest flexibility in terms of getting that right, because sometimes there is a bit of trial and error required. And also with things like pinning larger models as well, just to ensure that individual components can maybe be taken apart. Let's say you'll, you want to make a tank as easy as possible to get some paint in every little nook and cranny there without there being any gaps or having to, to use a rather slapdash approach. So now obviously we've got two different types of glue here. Loctite, I, I very, very rarely deviate away from this. And then you've got Ravel Contact a Professional. I've never had any issues with this as a plastic glue whatsoever. So obviously the super glue is ideal for metal and resin. And then the contactor there is, is um, essential for, for plastic glue, okay? Now, when it comes to pinning, I use this extremely basic um, uh, drill bit. Okay, this is again by the defunct company, Maplin. Um, there are much better ones out there uh, which have a little bit of a, a bearing at the bottom so you don't end up annihilating your hand, as I so frequently do. Uh, but as they say, no pain, no gain. Uh, but I, I will probably upgrade this at some point. Now I have a huge amount of additional assorted drill bits here as well. Um, other tools that I will use, uh, other gauges that I'll use for certain thicknesses. Um, now you can also use things like the drill bit, not only with, with copper wire, this is one millimeter copper wire, very, very cheap to buy an entire spool of that. And that will last me um, an incredibly long time maybe even till the 31st millennium, who knows? Uh, I've got some slightly thicker, stronger, um, like sort of bronze, brass rather, uh, paper clip there, okay? Which is very, very good. Let's say you wanted to have something very static. You didn't want it to move whatsoever. You're very confident that you've lined up those drill holes perfectly and you just need something like this in order to, to help pilot in a specific section from, from one tank or another um, along those lines, all right? So um, I will, do practical tutorials on these as well, uh, just to give you guys a very good idea of how to how to get it done properly, or at least the anvils of Connor way. Not to say that the way that I do things is correct. Obviously, there are other people with with other processes that they follow, but I just wanted to let you guys um, have some insight into the the way that I approach model making and the things that I I do and the tools that I use to make it as easy as possible for me. With that in mind, it's also very very handy to get yourself a pair. Of, of watchmakers uh, tweezers here very very fine point there okay uh, and these sometimes I've, I'm all thumbs I'm not very good I'll you know <laughs> never get so far as to gluing components to myself but this can be very very handy just to help you get things in place if you're working with very very fiddly very small components okay so there we go In this third and final part of the video, I just wanted to talk to you guys a little bit more about the materials I use and the tools that I could not do without when it comes to, to sculpting. Whether it's gap filling, sculpting soft armor, adding some embellishment on a particular model or you know, sculpting a cloak, things along those lines. Uh, these are my absolute bread and butter, so to speak. So working from left to right as before, we've got Milliput, this is just standard Milliput, okay. 
You don't need to go into using white or black or terracotta, anything along those lines. This really will do the trick. Um, this stuff, neat, is best to work with with a little bit of moisture. Again, you don't want to get it too wet because it does get quite messy. But the brilliant thing about Milliput is that it will cure rock hard, okay? Now I've got green stuff here, or Nidatite, okay? So this is done by a variety of different companies, whether it's um, Games Workshop or the Army Painter, I think, do a variety as well. Um, very much the same thing, yellow, blue, Milliput. Um, I usually mix it to about 60 to 40, blue to yellow, okay? And you want to avoid that bit in the middle there where, where the two colors meet, okay? Because that is, that is no good to use, okay? It doesn't mix very well at all. You end up getting little little pockets in your green stuff of, of un, unmixed material, which obviously is not ideal because it's still soft when everything else is cured. There's a, a metal sculpting tool here as well, okay? And then I've got ones that I never, never shut up about, but these are color shapers, okay? Uh, these are all by a company called Royal Sovereign Limited, and I've got a couple of different colors here. They, they come in three colors all together. So white, which has the most flexible rubber. Okay, very, very flexible. So that's if you want to be really, really gentle with your, with your mixed putty, all right? You've got gray, which is a little bit more firm. Okay, really, really good. And this is one of my favorite shapes as well, the chisel. And then you've got black as well, which is very, very hard. I don't tend to use the black, black stuff uh, because gray does, does it absolutely fine, what I need to do. Um, especially when you're, you're using Milliput, is a little bit more, um, it's a little, a little bit softer basically and easier to work with, e easier to get a smooth surface right off the bat using the grey coloured um, rubber tips rather than anything like black, okay? And that will obviously confer those characteristics over when you mix it with, with the Milliput, uh, with the green stuff rather. So, and like I said, 60 to 40 blue to yellow, and then I'll mix that in a 50 50 mix. With, uh, with Milliput here, okay? Again, you wanna keep it fairly dry, otherwise it, it can struggle sometimes to adhere, but once it's on the surface of the model that you're working on, uh, then you can get it a little bit wet, just to make sure that the tools will glide nicely and smoothly. You wanna make sure that you keep these tools nice and clean after every use, okay? So there's no dried Milliput or green stuff left on the tips there. That can damage them, and obviously you want to have as perfect a surface with these ones as possible, okay? So let's say that you've applied the, the sculpting putty to your model, like I said, whether it's um, gap filling, things along those lines, you then need to get around to, to cleaning it up afterwards. Very, very rarely will I sculpt something and get it bang on the first time. And certainly when I'm using things like Milliput, um, because it dries so hard, and I would not apply this over to, to green stuff, uh, but when I use a milliput in a mixture or neat, it's because it dries so hard, you can then use a, a scalpel, always a fresh blade, but uh, always carefully as well, but use a scalpel to remove any excess, okay? So for example, when I'm doing things like um, lengthening of legs, um, there's usually always a bit of excess that's, that's sort of poking out. I mean, just to grab a model for you very quickly. So you can see here, if it wants to focus. So you'll see where I've used the scalpel blade there just to make sure that it's all flush and it's all perfect. So when the paint gets applied to this miniature, uh, which is a very happy Empress Children chap that's about to get shat on from orbit on Istvan 3. Thanks, mate. Um, but you'll see you want it to get as uh, professional looking as possible. You want to make sure that your conversion looks like it came out of the box that way, if that makes sense. So using a, a scalpel blade, be it a, a 10A or a 9, which is great for getting into right-angled corners and things like vehicles, um, it really gives that, that perfect professional finish down the line. Like I mentioned earlier, I tend not to use things like files. You can if you really want to, if you really know what you're doing. But like I said, it's very easy to, to go all in with them and end up spoiling the work that you've spent so much time developing, learning how to do and, and executing. All right. Um, really hope that you like this video. Any questions, just uh, just comment below. Uh, if this has been helpful, please give the video a like and, and a subscribe to the channel, obviously, as well. And like I said in previous sections, I will, of course, be doing practical applications to these videos down the line. So stay tuned for those. Thanks a lot.